right, listen, I've decided that I would name this particular sermon, I titled it Tension in the Tent. Because I'm, you know, we're, we're in boot camp, and so we're thinking about, uh, you know, what happens during that time of training. And sometimes in boot camp, sometimes in our life, as we're trying to train, we find that there's tension in our tents. Are you with me on that? Sometimes there is. And uh, given what happens in our world today, it's understandable that there might be tension. And as we try to manage the demands of life, sometimes that tension erupts. And so the question we have is how can we manage that and ultimately keep it from erupting? Sometimes it happens on the way to church. Amen? And so I saw a little video. I think David gave it to me. Uh, some parents on their way to church with some kids. I thought you might uh, find this interesting. Here you go. Watch this video. Babe, can you hurry up? I can't figure out how to buckle this thing. We're going like three miles. <laughs> What are you doing? It's dry shampoo. Do you think I have time to shower? Why do you need that? Just wake up earlier. Oh, maybe if you'd help me with the kids, okay. I could bathe. I do everything in this house. Can I? Can Babe, you, can that seatbelt thing drives me crazy. It gives me a headache. Can you buckle up? Please? Okay, maybe if you would do your job, I wouldn't have to. I... Can you stop hitting your brother, please? I promise you, if I have to pull this car over, these spankings are about to be deep and wide. How long has this coffee been in here? I don't know, since last weekend. I don't care. You're in charge of the kids. Oh, I'm in charge of the kids? Uh, I don't know. Wives, submit to your husbands. Ever read that verse? You ever heard the song, It Takes Two to Make a Thing Go Right? That's not a Bible verse. Oh, We're not guys, going to the playground! Be quiet. I can't handle it. Oh. We are going to church. Oh. Well, I hope the sermon series is on patience today. Okay, what? You need it. Come on, where is it? Can Come you on. give me Where's that? The playground! We're not... We're about to go into church. Will you put your phone on silent? Okay, maybe you should put your voice on silent. Okay. Hey, we're like 15 minutes late to church. Should we just act like visitors and park in the front? I don't know. We gotta put on our flashers for that. Should we just drop the kids off and go to lunch? Can we even do that? We tie them up. We should. Let's drop the kids off and just go to lunch. How about that one? <laughs> Sometimes the tension mounts and sometimes it erupts and, you know, that's just part of life at times. But the question is, how can we manage that a little bit better? Paul finally moves in this uh, book of Ephesians. He's moving from teaching them theology and teaching them who they are in Christ. Now he's saying, let me give you some practical advice on how you can handle tension in your tents and how you might even avoid it. So follow along with me. The scripture will be up on the screen he has been emphasizing unity in the body, unity within the families. Unity is so important for us Christ followers. So here's what he says in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, I, I, Paul is writing this, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. Because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father, who is over all and in all, and look at that last part, living through all. And so Paul is saying, listen, you are one in the body. You are one in Christ now. Christ is living in you and through you. And so here's some ways that you ought to live. Because you are called, you and I are called to live a life that's worthy of your calling. You may say, now, I don't understand what you mean. What do you mean, a life worthy of your calling? I, 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 don't, I haven't heard any, anybody calling me. I, I, I'm not called. I don't understand what you're talking about. Here's what he means by that. What he's talking about is all of us are called as Christians to live a life that is more like Christ. That is, we're supposed to live like Christ lived. We're supposed to love like he loved. We're supposed to walk like he walked. We're supposed to emulate all that he talked and did in life. And so Paul says that's a life Worthy of your calling. Can you do that? So Paul says, here's, here's some things you can do to get there. It's a way of life. He's teaching us habits of the heart 
and skills that we need for genuine loving. So fill in this first point. Loving is something that you and I have to practice. You may think, oh, man, I got it down. I don't need to practice loving. But here's the reality. We need to practice it in our everyday life, practicing loving. And, and the more you practice it, you and I do, the better we get at it. But we got to know what love is first. We got to understand what love is. And so what better way to learn what love is than to turn to some children ages five, six, we'll see, four, five, six, I think are the ages of these children. Listen to what they had to say about love. They, they were asked, what, is, what does love look like? Tell us what love is. And so Chrissy, she is six years old. She, she already knows that love is sacrificial. Here's what she said. Her answer was, love is when you go out to eat and give, give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. That's what happens. That's what love looks like. Nika, now this is deep. Listen to what Nika says, age six. She sees love as a choice. She says this, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend that you hate. Ah, Nika's probably preaching somewhere now. <laughs> Lauren, age four, knows that love is an action. Here's what she says. I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. You'll grow up, Lauren, and you'll see. <laughs> Carl, age five. This is my favorite one of all. Carl, age five, knows what love smells like. Here's what he says. Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne, and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> <laughs> Kids get it, don't they? <laughs> so let me ask you, how good are you at practicing love? Have you, have you uh, mastered it? Are you really great at it? Let me tell you what Paul said about love. We're thinking about recruits and those who are learning to, to be Christ followers in a, in a powerful way. Listen to what he says about love. It's in chapter 13, the love chapter of 1 Corinthians. Listen to what it says. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. I mean, Paul gets it. He, he says, you know, you've got to learn to love the way Christ loved. You, you've got to learn to do this in your daily life because this is the way you, you live out, you lead a life worthy of your calling. We learned in our um, Build Your Marriage retreat, there were so many golden nuggets in what we learned there. And it applies not just to marriage, it applies to all relationships. But do you, I want you to hear this one that Brad Mitchell gave to us. He said this, he said, every day you and I are making deposits in the legacy we are leaving. Hear it again. Every day, you and I, we're making some kind of deposit, either good or bad, in the legacy that we're leaving behind us. And it's true. We're, we're making deposits of some kind. So here's the question. Are you living a life worthy of your calling? Because here's what it looks like. A life worthy of my calling is marked by, I'm going to give you five traits of love today that Paul mentioned in this letter to the Ephesians. Here's the first one. A life work, uh, worthy of my calling is marked by humility. Now, um, humility is something that's uh, it's easy to talk about, but sometimes it's hard to develop and live out. You remember the old country song, uh, It's Hard to Be Humble When You're What? When You're Perfect in Every Way. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, it is hard. Would you do that? Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Turn to your, turn to your neighbor, other neighbor and say this, when you're perfect. <laughs> when you're perfect. It's hard. It's really hard. But here's the reality. None of us are perfect. You know that. None of us are perfect. And, and I don't know where that song came from. I guess he's kind of making fun of the fact that, you know, I'm just perfect and, and it's okay. But I bet you would agree with me that even in today's society, it's hard to be humble because of what culture teaches us about who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do and how people are supposed to see us and, and we have our rights and our 
way of doing things, and we're entitled to it. But learning to be humble is really important, and we can do it. Here's the beauty of it. You can actually learn to be humble. Paul says you, be, you must be, always be humble. So being humble can affect so many areas of our lives. You, you probably know this as well. Being humble affects our relationships. It affects the way we lead others at work. If you're leading others at work, uh, it, it affects how you are perceived by those that you are around on a regular basis. I mean, do they see you as a humble person or do they see you as an arrogant person? Somebody who has to have their way. They're always pushing and they're not humble. You know, somebody said that the opposite of humility is pride. You know, you're just prideful. And, and I was reading uh, what someone else said about that. And they said, you know, I used to think that too. But you know what it really comes down to? Instead of pride, which probably fits in this category, the opposite of humility is selfishness. It's just got to be my way or no way. It's my way or the highway, we would say, because it's about me and what I want. And that's what selfishness is all about. And pride flows from that. And so that's the opposite of humility. Here's what the Bible says about humility. Look at Proverbs 29, verse 23. It says this. It says, pride ends in, in this interesting word, humiliation. There's the word humility in there. Humiliation. You will be humiliated if you live a prideful life. While humidity, look what it does. It brings honor. When you think about that, you think about people that you know that are humble people. You, you would say, you know what? That's honorable. There's something about them that, that is honorable. I, 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 like, I like them. Uh, because the people that need an extra dose of humility, you know any of those? Don't look around. A little extra dose of it. Those aren't the first people that you call up and say, hey, you want to go to dinner? You want to go out this week? Let's go out together. It's like, no, I don't, I don't want to hang around those people. Well, listen, if you're not humble, there are probably people who don't want to hang around you either. And so Paul says, always be humble. And here's what, he, what he's really saying. To be humble means to think, not, not to think less of oneself, but to think of oneself less. Quit putting yourself in front of everybody else. Instead, think of yourself less. Think of others more. That's the way to do it. Because that's what Jesus did. If you think about it, Brooks was teaching us that earlier. I mean, Jesus was in heaven and he, the Bible tells us that he, he emptied himself of his right to be there in heaven with the Father. I mean, Jesus was there when everything was created. Everything that was and is was created in and through him. And so he was there from the beginning. When, when life was breathed into the very first human being, Jesus was there. And he was exalted back then above everything. And so he gave that up and became human and the scripture tells us that he even humbled himself to the point of death, death on a cross. Jesus understood that. And that's who Jesus was. When I think about Jesus, sometimes people think, well, you know, he was weak or, or you know, he was meek or mild. And, and Jesus was none of that, really. He wasn't weak. Do you know how much strength it took to allow human beings, lowly human beings, to put him on a cross? He was strong. He was always strong. But listen to how he described himself. And I think you would agree with it. In Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29... There's this famous passage. You probably have heard it before. It says this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am, listen to these words, gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I mean, Jesus, Jesus wanted us, encouraged us to emulate him to be humble. And so are you humble? Are you always humble? Paul says you should be. But, but notice the Jesus said, I'm gentle and humble in heart, which leads me to the next one that Paul talked about. He says, always be humble and gentle. So there's the trait of love that you need next to humility is gentleness. Always be gentle. Here's the thing. Humility is an attitude. It, it's how you look at things and your attitude towards others and towards things. G gentleness is an action. It's what we actually do. And so would people describe you as a gentle person? You know, we always use the term, we, we do, a lot of people use the term, well, when you meet somebody that's, that kind of stands out for you, you, you'll say, well, he, you know what, he sure was a gentleman, or she sure was a gentlewoman. You say things like that, and so the gentleman idea, he's a gentleman. You want to teach your boys to be gentlemen, open the door, be courteous. And so I, I was looking at that word gentleman, and, and here's what it describes this person as. It says, those who are polite, 
and calm, kind, and considerate of others. That's what gentleness is. And, and so I wonder if people would recognize that in each of us. And of all people, Christians ought to be that because Jesus was. We ought to be gentle. We ought to be humble. But that doesn't mean we're weak. It doesn't mean we're mild or we're meek. It means we're choosing to be gentle. Proverbs 15.1 says this, A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. And so that gentleness there, if you can be gentle when you are having a discussion with your wife or your family, you can be gentle even there. And you're, you're reflecting that trait of love that is worthy of a life, worthy of your calling. And so gentle people are not quick to lose their temper or resort to aggression or violence in their words or in their action. And they're aware of the needs of others and they're considerate of those. The opposite of that would be harshness or demanding. That's the opposite of gentleness. So are you gentle? Are you humble? And then here's the third one that Paul talks about in the scripture today. And that's patience. This is the next mark of love. It's patience. Paul says, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. It's interesting. I, I, I love that he didn't say this. Be patient with everybody else, making allowance for everybody else's faults because of your love. Because here's the reality. All of us have faults. Everybody does. There is no perfect person. But sometimes patient is something we really need when we're dealing with people that are difficult to deal with. Amen? Sometimes there are people in our lives, it's like, I don't know what it is, but they just seem to live on our last nerve. Do you know those people in your life? Um, Paul, said, I mean, Paul said this when he's writing to Timothy. He's trying to teach Timothy about how to live as a, as a preacher. He'll be a preacher. But, but he's talking to all of us. Listen to what he says. He says, a servant of the Lord... That's all of us. Everybody here is a servant of the Lord, just like Paul. He's a prisoner of the Lord. We are too. Servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind. Look at that word. To everyone, be able to teach. You got to teach your kids and teach others. You're, you're making deposits in your legacy. And be patient with difficult people. Now, that's hard to do sometimes. We're all called to be say, servants. But honestly, it's hard sometimes to deal with difficult people. There was one preacher, he called them this. He said, he said, difficult people in your lives, they're like this. He called them heavenly sandpaper. You know what that is? <laughs> it's like, oh man, that's just rubbing, rubbing up against you all the time. I like what somebody else said. They said, those kind of folks are EGRs. Do you know what that is? Extra grace, Extra grace required. <laughs> Fill in that one. It's like, Lord, here comes this person. You ever meet those people? It's like you, you, go into, you go into work one day, you're just in a good mood. You had the best breakfast you've ever had. I mean, every green light you caught on the way to work, and, and you walk in the door, you turn the corner, and here comes that EGR person, like right in your face, and you're like, here's what you do. You stop, and you pray, Lord, give me some extra grace for this person right now because I need to show love the way you would have me Love. I need to exercise some patience with this person today. It, it, it's important to do. One of your next steps today is to identify that person. Somebody who really irritates you. Somebody who is hard to love. And, I, you know, you'll see in your next step, I was going to ask you to go ahead and fill it in, but you might not want to right now. You may want to wait till a little bit later. But there's somebody in your life. So maybe you asked this question this week. God, help me to have some extra grace this week, a little more patience with this person. I believe he'll do it. I believe he'll give you that grace. And then you'll be living a life worthy of your calling when you exercise that grace. Then here's the next one. So I got to be humble. I got to be gentle. Got to be patient. Here's the next one. I I've got to have some peacefulness. I don't even know if that's a word. I like it. I made it up. Which means this. I want to be a person of peace. I want to be a person who, who brings peace into the environment, whatever it may be. You know, he says this. He says, bind yourselves together with peace. It's like peace is the thing that really pulls you together. You know, I, I believe that most of the people that I meet with throughout my career as a ministry, in, as a minister, they're looking for peace. They're looking for peace in relationships. They're looking for peace of mind and who they are in, as they're relating to God. They're looking for peace when it comes to forgiveness for what they've done in their lives. 
Peace is what they're really looking for. And we want to be people of peace. I mean, Jesus is the prince of peace. And that's who we're supposed to be. And so we learned something else at the uh, marriage retreat. We learned that there's a difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. And, and it was really interesting to hear that because uh, I don't know if you know the difference or not, but as they explained it to us, what they said uh, is that a peacekeeper is someone who is always just trying to, to have peace in the environment. So they'll do things like this. They'll say, oh, don't worry about it. Just, you know, let's just, everything's fine. Let's just, we won't worry about that. Let's not talk about that. Let's, let's move on to something else. Let's just do something else. And so they, they mean well. They're trying to find peace in the home, but what they're not doing is dealing with the real issue, with the real tension in the tent. Instead, they're just kind of brushing it under the rug instead of dealing with it. Whereas a peacemaker is the person who says, you know what? Hey, that didn't, that didn't work well. How can, we, how can we deal with this issue? I mean, what's really the underlying issue here? And how can we find peace moving forward in this? And so they're, they're the ones who are willing to sacrifice. They're the ones who are willing to compromise. They're the ones who are willing to turn the, ex, turn the cheek, you know. They're, they're the ones who are, are willing to work for peace instead of just trying to brush it under the rug. Here's what uh, the psalmist wrote. David wrote in Psalm 34, he says this. He says, uh, turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Isn't that good? I mean, what if you are known as a peacemaker? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Because he knew that if there's someone who wants peace and works to maintain it, that's somebody of character. That's somebody of integrity. That's somebody who's living a life worthy of the calling we've been given. So humility, gentleness, patience, all of those things, if we can work those into our life on a regular basis, guess what it does? It promotes peace and unity within the family unit or at work or wherever it may be. And then here's, here's, here's the last one. Number five is this. I, I, my mark of love should be forgiving. I want to be forgiving of others, and I want to be forgivable. I want to be forgivable. Paul says, make allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Um, and sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes it's really hard to forgive. I, I remember uh, years ago, my mother and daddy had a place at, at Lake Sinclair that ultimately Debbie and I had. And next door to them were some of our dear, dear friends. They lived in Macon. He was a lawyer. My daddy was a judge and a lawyer. And they, had, they got along really, really well. They were good friends of us. We helped raise their kids. Really, really good friends. Well, along the way over the years, something happened between my mother and uh, the wife at the next door neighbor's house. They got into some disagreement over something. The interesting part was that we had a uh, driveway that circled around our place, but it also came through our property, and, and our neighbors could use that driveway to scoot into their property. They had a separate driveway on down, and it was harder to get through and a little narrow, so they would come through our driveway to go to their house. My mother got so mad with her neighbor that you know what she did? She put a chain across that driveway. <laughs> my mother did that. <laughs> I'm like, Mom, what, 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 what's the deal with the chain? She said, wow, we're, I'm mad with her. She's mad with me. And we decided they're not going to use my driveway anymore. I'm like, okay. And, and we went with that for a while, didn't we, Debbie? And it was, it was embarrassing. Can I tell you that? Because I loved our neighbors, and, and, and so did my mom. But, boy, they were mad with each other. And I don't know who started it. I don't know who, who caused it. But my mom didn't help. But here's the thing. A little while later, I don't know why or how it came about, but one day they just got together and said, I'm sorry. You know, it, it was one of those kind of things where by the time they got to that point, they, they had forgotten what really got them mad with each other. You ever been there? And it's like, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I love you more than whatever that problem was. And they reconciled, and for the next, I don't know, 20 years of my mother's life, they were dear, 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 dear friends. She was at my mother's funeral. She was at my daddy's funeral. I mean, that's the kind of friends they became because they, were, they, they had to be intentional about being forgiving and forgivable. So, so this is who we want to be. I must be quick, fill this one in, to mend fences. I like that idea. And that's not my idea because I actually got it from the scripture. In uh, Ephesians, the message version or 
you know, translation of the, of the scripture says it this way. L- look at this passage. I love this passage. It says, I want you to get out there and walk. Better yet, let's try it again. I want you to get out there and walk. Better yet, run on the road God called you to travel. That's the life that we're supposed to live. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. In other words, I want you to do some things. I want some action in this, Paul is saying. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love. Alert at noticing differences. That is, we all have our differences. We're not all alike. And quick at mending fences. You were called, you were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction, so stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. And so, if I'm going to live that kind of life, here's what i got to do. i got to be willing to forgive, and i got to be forgivable. In other words, don't hold on to grudges. Let them go. Mend fences. And you're going to deposit into your legacy good deposits. You know, humility and gentleness and patience peacemaking, being peacefulness, having peacefulness and mending fences is not a sign of weakness. Those things are not signs of weaknesses. I love this idea. Instead, I was trying to think whether the opposite of that would be. You said, well, they're, 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 they're you know, strong, you know, signs of strength. Here's what I came up with. They are beams of love. It's, it's, like, it's like every time you are intentional about being humble or gentle or patient or peaceful or forgiving. It's like you're sending out from you through the work of the Holy Spirit, a beam of light that's going into darkness and it's shattering the darkness. And so people around you are drawn to you because that light is coming through the light of Christ. Remember it said he's living in you and through you. It's coming through. And they're like, now, you know what? When I go out to dinner, that's the person I want to call. Those are the folks I want to hang around. And so it makes me wonder, am I that person for others? If I'm not, hear me out, I'm not living, I'm not leading a life worthy of the calling that we've been given. Paul says this, he says, you can be the best trained soldier in the unit. You can do, you can score all A pluses on everything you do in boot camp. But if you don't love like this, then you aren't leading that kind of a life or your identity as Christ, son or daughter, does not come through. And so he says, do that. Do that with everything you have. Make every effort to do that. So your encouragement this week is, you can do it. It's hard, but you can do it. So I've got some next steps for you. Here they are. The first one is this. I will practice love this week, one step at a time, starting today. That means on the way home, don't want to see that video playing at your house that we saw earlier. This week, I will show extra grace to. Go ahead and fill in that name. Now, if it's somebody with you, don't fill it in right now. (laughs) I will ask God to give me even more patience this week. Who can't use that? And then what if there was just a little bit more peace in your home this week? Wouldn't that be good? You would know that you're leaving the right deposit in your legacy. (music) 